So to me, the fascinating thing with this discussion is that the people that are deconstructing or have gone through deconstruction or have been open to this kind of reimagining, rebuilding and re redoing their faith constantly is that they tend to be the faithful people. They tend to be the ones who are saying, there's a lot of mustard seeds around here. Why aren't we moving mountains? Hello, and welcome to Ancient Jesus Future Faith. I am one of your hosts, Tana Shiver, and I am here as always with Sarah Minardi. Hello. And Don Shiver. Hey. And today uh, we're gonna have a conversation about faithfulness versus faith. Don, you mentioned that you were having a conversation with someone who is deconstructing and this concept came up in the conversation. So I'm going to turn it over to you to get us started. I, I really thought we were, had discussed that we were going to lead with you singing George Michael. I <laughs> will not. Okay. okay. I mean, that's in my wheelhouse of pop culture. So yes, it is. It's right, right in that perfect, right time. in that, in that wheelhouse. So I think a lot of people who are deconstructing are wrestling with, do I maintain this faith? Do I maintain my faith or do I just abandon faith and move on? And I think that this is a, it, it, I think it's a, maybe an unnecessarily complicated question that we're asking ourselves because of the way that faith has been articulated. So may, maybe a good way to, to start is for the two of you to share maybe when someone says faith, what, how, how, what goes through your mind? Like, how does that process for you when you hear someone talk about their faith? Like, mm -hmm. or someone say they want to share their faith or someone says, I have a personal faith. What, what is, what is faith? Like, what is that entity? Well, I think it's when somebody wants to share their faith, it's like they want to share their belief system. Mm -hmm. um, when somebody just says you need to have more faith or have faith, then it's just like a pithy saying that just is like... George you, Michael <laughs> is not a pithy saying, Sarah. <laughs> when you don't know what else to say, you know, like <laughs> just a, a Band-Aid and a, um, from a, someone who wants to wear their super spiritual badge. Ooh, <laughs> I've been. Oh, I didn't get one of those in Girl been, Scouts. <laughs> I have been trying so hard to get that badge. Um, were you, I'm sorry. Were you gonna? Go I think on? I was done. Okay. <laughs> you know, I had a visceral reaction to when you were like, if someone says they want to share their faith. I, I know. Was like, I got the side eye. Ugh, because I just for me that just has so many connotations because it's usually. There's usually like no interest whatsoever in who you are or where you are. It's just they want to be like, here's why you should, you know, be this type of Christian or whatever. Um, so, yeah, so it feels it's so interesting because I think there's so many good things that go with the concept of faith. But there's so many ways that it's been weaponized that um, like the ha you just have to have more faith. Mm -hmm. I I've had, I've seen that weaponized in so many ways. And I've heard that like, I'm an anxious person. I, in case neither of you picked up on that <laughs> in 27 years, that description Just, would have never risen to my mind. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if you've noticed honey, but I worry a lot. I think um, she was talking to you, Sarah, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah. And so I've had, people throughout my life be like, well, if you just had more faith, you wouldn't worry. And that just felt too... Because again, what do they mean by that? Right. right. And yeah. it just felt too simplistic. And then at another time, um, when we did those spiritual gifts assessments, when we were attending a mega church, mm -hmm. I was told I had the gift of faith. I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> Yeah. You just haven't unlocked it yet. You had to level up. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's there. Yeah. <laughs> it just needs to be, yeah. Real, a real quick diatribe about spiritual gifts assessment. Oh, please. <laughs> if you, if your spiritual gifts assessment doesn't return uh, not compatible 
if an atheist fills it out, then it's just a skills assessment. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> um, and also tends to go more towards helper and administration roles for women. Yeah. And but. I, and by the way, I'm not at all suggesting anything about how a- atheists are. I'm talking about the fact that it's just not really a spiritual assessment. Right. It's, it really is a skills or talent assessment. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway. <laughs> so did you give me a definition? Of faith? Yeah. What is it? Um, if, uh, what, what do they usually say? Belief in things not seen. Okay. Yeah. What, what is the one quote? Um, faith is being willing to take the first step when the staircase is not seen. I'm, yeah. I'm like mi- mixing it up, but. Okay. Yeah. People. All right. Uh, <laughs> great. <laughs> so first of all, I want to say a couple of things just about maybe that specific definition. One, it's irony, and this is, we had a conversation about, you know, begs the question or irony, so you guys can tell me if this is actual irony, is that the church lives in certainty in most cases, not actually in faith, while saying you need to have faith, but yet are very certain about their rules and their doctrines Mm -hmm. about exactly what you have to believe in order to have faith. But yeah. that means that you have to have certainty about this list of things in order to be considered to have the ability to take a step that you can't quite see. They yeah. are certain that their faith is correct. <laughs> yeah. So there's already some issues in the fact that in the church, faith is really just a shortcut to say doctrine. Mm. Um, in a lot of ways, right? And that might not be the case across the board, but I, I find that to be true in a lot of yeah. a lot of situations. So there's there's a verse um, that talks about having faith the size of a mustard seed, right? Right. And it says if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, which by the way they're standing on the Temple Mount. <clears throat> Excuse me, they're standing on the Temple Mount mm-hmm. when Jesus says this. Mm -hmm. Right. So he says, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain Mm -hmm. and cast it into the sea. Right. You could tell this mountain to go and and just cast it into the sea. How did what does that mean? Not not about this mountain or casting it into the sea, not that. But what does that mean? If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you could do this. Well, I think it's been used to like. um shame people yeah that it's like well you just don't have enough faith to be healed or um in different scenarios that like because you really just need to have faith the size of mustard seed and it's always emphasized and or it was always many times taught that mustard seed is small (laughs) you know so it's like as much as i don't know about agriculture i know a mustard seed is small (laughs) um yeah (laughs) yeah and that I feel like that can be really dangerous because then the people who really, really believe that, like I knew somebody who was dying from cancer, but they were totally like, oh, I yeah. have, I have faith. God's going to heal me and didn't, didn't get treatment did, because they were like, God's going to heal me. And then they died. Yeah. Yeah. Oof, that was heavy. Sorry. <sighs> no, it's but you're right. Sad. I remember, yeah. I remember that situation very yeah. Very distinctly. Yeah. Um, they were actually going to seminary mm-hmm. while this was happening. Mm-hmm. So I, I think there's two ways to read that verse uh, that are at least interesting. Mm-hmm. One is, I don't see this mountain moving, so shut up about your faith. <laughs> like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, I've I, never heard. That's that's the the DRSV, <laughs> the, the Don's standard revised, revised version. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, the Don's sarcastic revised version. There you go. So, it's it's that way. That okay. Look, let's let's recognize that mountains aren't being thrown into the sea. Yeah. So let's stop having conversations about faith. Right. I think another way to say it is. Um, so this, this might be new to a lot of our audience, a a lot of more progressive people 
mm-hmm. have really fallen in love with N.T. Wright. I have some pretty significant issues with mm-hmm. N.T. Wright in some areas. But one of the things N.T. Wright has done and introduced to kind of more of the average lay person of progressive Christianity is the idea that faith, when it says faith in Jesus, a better, more accurate translation for its culture and context is rather instead of its faith in Jesus, it is the faithfulness of Jesus, right? So it is because of the faithfulness of Jesus that you are saved, Hmm. not it's because of your faith in Jesus that you are saved, Right. Hmm. And that that's a huge shift. I mean, that's that's pretty significant. Yeah. And so faithfulness implies the way that a person functions, behaves, lives within the world and according to the way God would have them. And so I think another way of reading this mustard seed piece Mm -hmm. is uh, if everyone just showed a mustard seeds worth of faithfulness, mountains could be moved. Right. Right. If if we all just put in a little bit of effort of faithfulness, even this mountain could be moved. I think that's a really powerful picture. I think both of them. One, the first one's more funny, but I think the second one is more powerful. (laughs) Right. Mm -hmm. Right. That instead of uh, talking about what we believe, instead, if we were faithful collectively with very little effort, we could move mountains. And and I think that that rings true to me. I don't know if that rings true to the two of you or not. Yeah. It's interesting um, when you're talking about the mountain being the temple, because it just made me think of a couple things like, well, why would the temple, we want the temple to be moved? So it'd be a mobile sanctuary. Yeah. So it'd be a mobile sanctuary, (laughs) you know, or, you know, if, if, yeah, either that like embodiment of faithfulness individually or, would it be like the idea that like the temple can move so more people can access the temple? Mm-hmm. You know, it's two different thoughts that it kind of led me to thinking about that. If the mountain is the temple. Yeah. I'm curious about that. Um, what, how that changes, how that changes the interpretation of this Verse, because the first thing that came to mind was, you know, if you have the faith of the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain. And I was like, oh, it only applies to that one. <laughs> it's just it's just that one. It doesn't mean you can move any mountain. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the I'd like to hear more about the Temple Mount. Yeah. Or another thing that popped in my head, is it a, is it a commentary on the people who were running the temple? Like more like these people can be moved. Like if we had faith and faithfulness, then we could change what's going on in in the temple for the better. So, so I, I love these questions, but I was totally not prepared <laughs> for you two to become fixated on the fact that this was the Temple Mount. What I would say off the cuff, and I I have reserved the right to come back and change this. <laughs> well, yeah, we're just these are just ideas. This is play, we're just right? Spitballing. We're spitballing. <laughs> we're playing in the text, you know, we like are, throwing yeah. randomness out. <laughs> is that the Temple Mount is that space where heaven and earth connect? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and the idea is more so about the fact that even God's house could be moved. Mm. Right. Even the place at which heaven and earth kiss could be moved. And I think it's more about uh, the profundity of that entity, which seems unmovable. Yeah. Particularly since it's where God's house is, that than it is anything meant to imply something deeper about the Temple Mount itself. Does that make sense? I think it's more so like if Jesus was like, if you had faith the size of a mustard mustard seed, even this uh, log laying over here could be moved. I, I just don't think it rings with the same kind of power as even God's house could be picked up and moved. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's more amazing than moving a mountain. But um, I have a question. The Is this... Okay. 
he said it was the place where heaven and earth meet. And we just talked about Jacob's ladder. Thank you. And Bethel. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it did, is this, was this built there? I did mention briefly that tradition has it that that is where the temple is. I thought I remembered you saying. Okay. I don't know that that's 100% agreed upon okay. or anything, but there are those who make that connection. Yeah. Okay. Well, I like in the community idea of it too that you mentioned that, like, if as a community you had faithfulness, you could move them out and, and <clears throat> um, or move the temple. I mean, obviously, the point being something immovable. But yeah, doing difficult things becomes easier when we do it in community, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. which is like when you mentioned the log kind of pops to mind or like if you had to move a piano, you need at least four people, you know. Right. And <clears throat> if you had 10, it would be lighter for each person. Yeah. And I think what that leads us to then is to say, if if all of us collectively with just the faithfulness the size of a mustard seed were to do this, we can move this mountain. It then leads us to say, well, how much more could we do if we contributed even more faithfulness? Mm. Because when you think about the size of a mustard seed, it is insignificant. Mm -hmm. But if all the people of faith, all the faithful people, enacted their faithfulness, just even a a smidge, it it could change the world. Okay, but the... Okay, so... The verse says, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, but then you were just talking about faithfulness. Right, because I'm invoking N.T. Wright's interpretation of faith, which is about faithfulness, not a belief system. Okay. Right? Okay. So, and this is really important. When one of my favorite quotes by the rabbis is, you have 100,000 Jews and therefore 100,000 interpretations of Torah. Right, right. Judaism was not about correct belief. Right. It was about what? What works, basically. Yeah, I, I want us to, uh, to avoid the term works that's, because that's, that's really... True. Yeah, it, following the commands, yeah. being obedient, being a part of, of doing what God has called us to do. And that is called faithfulness. Right? Um so based on what you know about a person, that then leads you to behave a certain way towards them if you care about them, even if you don't care about them, to be fair, right? And you would describe that as being faithful to them, right? Mm-hmm. Like if I know that uh, Tana does not like chocolate, <laughs> <laughs> then, then I would be being faithful to her by not bringing chocolate into the house, right? Because that's something I know about her. But there's things that we learn about each other as we grow that changes then the way we behave towards each other. And that is because of a commitment to faithfulness, right? That as I learn more, as my understanding changes, as my depth of knowledge about someone, something, whatever it is, uh, evolves, so does my behavior. And so this is, to me, where we really would do better talking in Christianity about instead of right belief, we would instead talk about faithfulness, right? Any thoughts? I am, I, I just, you said instead of right belief, my brain automatically filled out the rest right behavior, which feels very different than faithfulness. And, um, which is why I've been using faithfulness as a behavior. Yeah. And I just, um, I just think that's an important distinction because there are some, yeah, faithfulness feels very different than the, like, Oh, you're supposed to do these things and not do these things. That kind of like, um, legalistic prescriptive thing that we get from a lot of, uh, modern Christians, Mm -hmm. you know, um, versus, oh, you're going to, you're going to do this stuff because of your love for people and correct. Yeah. 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 It was just making me think that like losing your religion is not 
does not mean that you're going to lose your faithfulness. Correct. Or it doesn't have to mean mm. you lose faithfulness. Yes. And this is why, the, this is part of the reason that conversation came up this week uh, with the person I was coaching with deconstruction is that they were wrestling with this idea of, I don't know if I have, if my faith is the same. And I know this person well enough that I was like, but you are such a faithful person. And it's not about, do you, are you going to maintain your beliefs? That's, that's immaterial. I believe something about Jesus and God today that is different than when I was a child attending Sunday school. Mm. I didn't, in the midst of that, I would have never said as that evolved and reshaped and was reimagined and grew and matured that um, I abandoned the faith of my childhood, mm -hmm. right? I think a lot of people going through deconstruction have been handed an either or. Yeah. Either you maintain your faith mm -hmm. or you're out. Yeah. And the reality is, and again, another great rabbinic saying I love is that if you worship the same God today mm. as you did yesterday, mm -hmm. you are worshiping an idol, right? Because if indeed we are meant to be growing, evolving, changing our perspectives on the world, on ourself, on, on the metaphysical, then we have to constantly be changing what we know and understand to be true about this other entity, God, Yahweh, Jesus, whatever it is, however you have connected with it, that is always going to be reshaping. Yeah. 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 I wanted to say something because when you were talking about saying you are a faithful person, I can't help but in my mind the faithful person, the picture that pops in my mind is somebody who goes to church, attends the events mm. that the church puts on, mm. gives to the church. Like that's what like pops in my head. So like, what are some examples of a faithful person that aren't so tied up in like doing what a church expects you to do? Yeah. That goes back to what I was saying about how there's a difference between like expected behaviors and faithfulness. Yeah. I'd say, I, I think about what you said a, a couple weeks ago on the podcast that um, you you started to do your own, you started you created a homeschool musical uh, group to to create and perform a musical because why? Tell us again. Because the experience that my daughter had um, with when she was in a musical, the director yelled at her and. Um, so she didn't want to be part of it anymore. And so as you, Sarah, have connected with this thing called faith, you have developed a faithfulness to God that then plays out into the faithfulness towards other people. And that is being developed in this, that you want to talk kindly to these children. You don't want to create a scenario where there's anxiety, any additional outside of performing any additional anxieties applied to them. And so you are being faithful by creating that space because that is what you have come to know is good and beautiful and true about the way we are to live in this world. Right? Yeah. That's you being faithful. Um, I think for a lot of people being faithful could be leaving their church. Mm. Yeah. Because their church adheres to things that are harmful mm -hmm. because their church adheres to things that marginalizes people. And I think people could be very faithful leaving the church. Mm. Yeah. And I, I think that those are important things for us to understand, which is why it's hard to have conversations around when folks are deconstructing. Uh, oftentimes people are told, well, don't, don't, don't abandon the church or don't abandon the faith. 
deconstructing does not mean abandoning faithfulness. Because most people I know who have deconstructed and left religion still would consider themselves faithful people when it comes to caring for their neighbor. They're faithful to the world in ways that have been shaped by their understanding of the way the world is supposed to be about justice, about mercy, about compassion. And that faithfulness is powerful. It talks about in the book of Romans that there are some people that have never heard Torah, have never heard the law, but yet abide by it Mm -hmm. because they are people that recognize the way the world should be. And therefore they are functioning in a more faithful way, Mm -hmm. Romans implies, Mm -hmm. than those who have heard the Torah and do not follow it. Mm. And so they are being a, they are being a more faithful people because of the way that they are living out and focusing on justice, mercy, compassion, etc. And and this is so to me important because we've made this a debate about are you still going to believe Jesus is God incarnate? Mhm. Mm. And that Jesus died for your sins. And that if you profess Jesus' name, then you'll go to heaven. Mm-hmm. And if you and that the word or the Bible is the literal word of God. And these are some of the doctrines that we have, right? And if you don't believe those things, mm-hmm. then you've abandoned the faith. Right. And I would argue that believing those things let, let's let's imagine, for example, uh, Jesus is God incarnate. That one. I used to get in trouble at a church I pastored for seven or eight years <laughs> because I said God more often than I said Jesus. And I said, do you believe that Jesus is God incarnate? And they're like, yes. I was like, then when I say God, I'm referring to both. What's the problem? But they differentiated. Mm-hmm. Right? And because even though they said Jesus is God incarnate, Mm -hmm. there was a fear that if we didn't say Jesus, people would misunderstand. Mm. And so even that doctrine that seems so simple and obvious, or Mm -hmm. that the Bible is the literal word of God, and then you say, well, doesn't the Bible tell us to, you know, tell them to bash the children against the rocks? (laughs) Well, (laughs) I think in that instance... Right? Yeah. Or um, doesn't the Bible say that you uh, aren't allowed to wear uh, braids in your hair to church? Well, that's a cultural thing. That's, and it's like, nope. So people still, even with those clearly obvious doctrines mm-hmm. and correct beliefs, mm-hmm. diverge greatly about what they mean. Yeah. Yeah. And so to say that, to abandon those things is to abandon faith is ludicrous. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. I, I'm also glad that you said about, you talked about how there are people who were like living out Torah, but didn't know, had never heard of Torah. Cause I hear a lot from Christians that, like when they're talking to somebody who isn't a Christian or whatever, they're like, well, how would you have morality if not for Christianity? (laughs) Like it's, it's like the only, it it is, it is very strange, a very stark difference for some people where it's like, if you're an atheist, then you are evil. There's like, it's like you have to, there's no way that you could come up with any moral or good behaviors outside of Christianity, which I find Interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's it's absurd. Yeah. Um. So, anyway, and I think that all extends then to like church attendance. Like, how can you consider yourself a faithful person if you're not attending church? If you're not saying Jesus enough? If you're not, yeah, you know, there's like all these little rules. Yeah, and even sometimes the people who show up at church are called the faithful, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like yeah, if yeah. it turns into a, is that a noun then? 
right? Like it's like yeah. when you're like the faithful. Although I often say, I often say <clears throat> the faithful. If you're if you're a member of the faithful, because Christian has become so loaded, yeah, that yeah. I will. Hopefully, when I say the faithful, if someone isn't sure what I'm talking about, will be like, what, what do you mean by that? As opposed to, but yes, I do think people will say, oh, they're faithful. They're here every Sunday. Yeah. Or you can count on them. They'll be, they, they attend everything we do. They're faithful. The faithful few. Yes. And I think that that is absolutely then putting pressure in attendance as opposed to uh, intention. I think that's, and I think that's one of the things that saddens me about a lot of like, uh, Christianity today is that it does seem very caught up on certain behaviors. Um, and then of course saying the right things and everything. And I just constantly think of that, like, well, you clean the outside of the cup, but not the inside. Mm -hmm. And it just, it seems very focused on the outside of the cup. Yeah. Yeah, totally agreed because like, you know, it's celebrating people attending church. It's like celebrating like an outward action. Yeah. And like, yeah. instead of honoring that, like there's times that people cannot attend right? because maybe they're sick, whether it's physically or mentally or they, they need help or like, um, even honoring people being on time. And as a mom with children, I know sometimes it's hard to get someplace on time. Um, but when there's that societal pressure for anything of like being at places and being on time, which I understand the importance of that, right? It's, it's can be a a slippery slope if you're trying to accomplish things and people are always late and always not there. So I understand why it's celebrated, but it's almost celebrated like to a fault where, people will send their sick children to school so that they can get a perfect yeah, attendance. Yeah. And I even hearing recently, like on social media, a friend just so sad because like her child had missed days for like either a sickness or a doctor situation. And now they weren't going to be able to go to a classroom party or a class field trip, some sort of like prize for attendance mm. and i remember the prizes for as opposed attendance. to a prize for healthiness yeah right and i remember there being prizes for attendance in um in uh that is sad. in elementary school yeah um back then, my teachers are always yeah. sick <laughs> <laughs> back then it was um a free buffet at ponderosa remember that place ponderosa <laughs> wow <laughs> you're speaking my age <laughs> But then also to the point of like getting on time that like, it, you know, I would much rather see a family, especially like with young children, come in late and in good spirits. Like I think the more yeah. faithful thing is is all those moments of how you um, interact with your child. And when there's this pressure of time all the time and sometimes we're not that good at managing it or things get in the way, then there's just always – there's you know, it's a common thing. It's like in TV shows and comics about parents yelling at their kids to get ready, right? Yeah. But like, it's not necessary. Like to yeah. yell at your either like there's ways to fix that. Either having more time or things like that. And but the society pr pressure to yeah and celebrating on time. It's like the outward cup thing. Mm -hmm. It's like or it's like the family picture thing. Like oh, we got the great family picture, but like the chaos that went around it. Right. And I'm just so anti all of that chaos of like rushing children and like fighting. And like, I feel like there's a lot of faithfulness to be celebrated and nobody sees it. Right. Because it's, it's not the final picture or even people may judge you for it because you're coming in late. But if you're coming in late because you responded kindly when you Preach. got, to, when you got down the road yeah. one block and your daughter said she had to go to the bathroom and you had to turn around and go back and make sure she went to the bathroom. And, you know, like, you know what this reminds me of? It reminds me of we were talking about um, when we did the um, the the parable of the, the good neighbor, not Samaritan. And uh, we we talked about that um, situation. It was like it was either an experiment. You know, I think it was like an experiment where like at a Christian college, a professor taught on that 
passage. Oh yeah. And then like, they kind of like <clears throat> placed someone on in, mm. in their path that, you know, needed help. Um, but they were like going to be late for class if they stopped. And like the number of people who didn't stop, even just after hearing that message, I think that really speaks to that societal pressure of, I have to fulfill these obligations Mm -hmm. to certain authority figures, um, before I, (laughs) you know, do the faithful thing and care for my neighbors, which, yeah. Yeah. Yeah think that pressure is pretty high and i don't know what the answer is because yes eventually like or essentially we need people to be on time and at places for things to happen so it's not like it's you know a super easy thing to think about but i I, I think there's a difference between being faithful and therefore interrupted Mm. right jesus would say you know, the disciples would try to keep children away so that the children wouldn't interrupt Jesus. Mm -hmm. Uh, And Jesus was faithful to the children and listened to them and gathered with them, right? I think there's, there's a difference between us being faithful and therefore delayed, um, you know, moved whatever way it might be um, off the target. And then there is just in consideration. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that's what it comes down to. It's just, yeah. are, are you being inconsiderate? Or are you being faithful? And I, I think that most of us can see the difference. Um, even if it's to ourself, like I had to hit snooze one more time <laughs> and that's you being faithful to yourself. That yeah. isn't you being inconsiderate necessarily. Yeah. Right. right? Um, so what I, I guess what I want to kind of move us and, and talk about then is, and Sarah, if you don't mind, you, you mentioned this again in another podcast, uh, the, I didn't desire your sacrifice, I desired mercy. And I think this goes into it, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. This plays into it because we would say faith, right? This is what modern Western evangelical primarily, but modern Western Christianity would say is faith is knowing what you're supposed to do, Mm. which is giving a sacrifice Mm -hmm. for the Jewish people at that time. Mm -hmm. Right. Can you explain kind of using this concept? I know I'm kind of putting you on the spot, but using this concept about differentiating between uh, knowing the right thing or the right belief or the right whatever it might be and what instead God wanted and how that might be kind of a good place for us to look for faith slash faithfulness. Yeah. I was just struck when I was like thinking about, um, you know, the idea that God does not desire sacrifice. He desires mercy and thinking that, um, well, the Torah is full of sacrifice, so that doesn't exactly make sense, but just felt like I picked up on um, like possibly a nuance that made it make sense to me, which was um, God desires the mercy. Like that's like the end goal of what he's desiring, but he also, the sacrifice is like the means to the end of the mercy. So in some ways he does desire the sacrifice. It's not like mutually exclusive. He doesn't desire it at all, but the sacrifice is a tool to get to the mercy. So in this case, if you're saying that faith, knowing the right things to believe is the sacrifice. Um, and what, it, so then, then if we're paralleling that idea, then the question becomes, what is God ultimately desiring? Mm-hmm. So, and it even makes me think immediately of like the 10 commandments, like, these are a list of things that um, can be like extracted and like misapplied and things like that, or just be looked at as like a bunch of rules or a burden. But if you dig deep into what God's trying to do with the Ten Commandments, especially like in the first four, you really see God's heart that He's trying to help the people who are coming out of a system of oppression and slavery to realize that like. He is their God now, and he is a God that is going to give them rest. Yeah. Um, and that's like the ultimate goal. So like, I guess with the faith idea, then it's the question of like, what is God's ultimate desire? Well, God's ultimate desire is that we act in these faithful ways, that we 
love our neighbor, that we have compassion, that we take care of each other. That Not we, just that we can list them. Yeah, and that we look for justice. And this is exactly why anybody could do those things. Yes. Because if you're a compassionate, empathetic person who's aware of what's going on in the world, you can do those faithful things. So did that answer it? Yeah. I, I think this is where, for me, I, I find that most of the people going through deconstruction are going through deconstruction because of faithfulness, Mm. not a lack of faith, right? That they are seeing behavior. They are seeing the lack of faithfulness of Christian leaders, the lack of faithfulness of uh, their neighbors who profess uh, Christianity. They're seeing the lack of faithfulness and saying, I can't be identified with that. And so in my faithfulness that says being mean, being oppressive, being Mm. harsh, being harmful to others Mm -hmm. goes against what I believe it means to be faithful. And so I need to leave this space. So to me, the fascinating thing with this discussion is that the people that are deconstructing or have gone through deconstruction or have been open to this kind of reimagining, rebuilding and re redoing their faith constantly is that they tend to be the faithful people. They tend to be the ones who are saying, there's a lot of mustard seeds around here. Why aren't we moving mountains? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why is the mountain still here? Why is it still sitting in this space? And it's not because of a lack of a belief It's due to a lack of behavior. It's due to a lack of then taking what we believe to be true about the character of God and reflecting it in meaningful ways into the world. And because of that, I need to rethink everything I've been taught from the pulpit. I need to rethink everything I've been taught about what God desires from me because this does not match the faithfulness I had believed it would be. Mm -hmm. I think where the church has messed up, and I believe I've mentioned this before on the podcast, or maybe it was on one of our live streams we've done. If the church was actually healthy, one of the ways it would express its health would be that it would be constantly encouraging people to to let their faith be tumbled amongst the rocks, uh, amongst each other, and us constantly refining, reshaping, reimagining what faithfulness is. But what we've done is made it a system of beliefs Mm -hmm. that have very little to do with behaviors. Think about the, like, list the beliefs that you you've run into in church and only one of them typically is about behavior are you talking about like doctrinal things yeah like what are some doctrines that you've seen churches list on their website and i i believe there's only one that has to do with behavior that's the one that has to do with behavior yeah i think all the other ones have little to do with behavior that's about like Believing in the er inerrancy of the Bible, that Jesus is the Savior, like it's usually a bunch of stuff like that. The Holy Trinity. Yeah. None of it's behavior, except for in more recent years. Adding the... Adding the marriage between one man and one woman. Right? Outside of that, none of them have to do with faithfulness. Mm -hmm. They only have to do with... Do you believe this to be true? These particular things, yeah. And the Bible is clear. You cannot comprehend God because God is above and beyond our understanding. Yeah. Yet we would argue that you are not a member of the faith if you don't know truths about God. And I don't know that I've ever seen a doctrine say, God is love. 
Mm. Like you, that that's a belief you have to have in order to be considered a part of our church is that God is love. I'd be curious to, I haven't really looked at like doctrinal statements of churches in a long time. And I, I wonder with the more kind of progressive strain of Christianity, if there is a church that has something, you know, like that, or maybe about serving the poor or, you know, yeah, but, but yeah, that's something that I've always found a little confounding about people who are so certain in their specific version of Christianity um, because of the whole, like, you know, God is, God is like unknowable uh, fully, you know? And, and I just constantly think, wow, you figured out everything that the greatest being in the universe, the creator of all of this, you you just got him pegged, huh? <laughs> like it's just, in in four sentences, right? It just feels so arrogant to me. I I don't know. Anyway, but I do do think like doctrinally that's where it is. But then like once you get into the church, then there's that's all when all the behavior like more behavior stuff comes in of you know being guilted if you don't attend, being told uh, your all of your immoral behaviors, you know all that stuff. Which seems to be a church thing, not a God thing. Right. Yeah. And this is this is where I think people are even being harmed as they're walking away from the church. Yeah. And I think just judging from all the different people I've spoken to who are um, who have deconstructed in some way, either like they're still within a church or they're still faithful but not attending a church, or they've left church behind altogether. There are so many of those expectations that that they still carry with them and have difficulty, um, like extracting themselves from. I guess is the only way I can think to put it, and that's that's sad to me. Yeah. So so then, what do you think the role? of the church is if it is not about teaching faith to be mobile sanctuaries <laughs> i mean seriously i've, I've been explain that in case people haven't yeah. listened to that episode well why haven't you listener <laughs> <laughs> um yeah so the idea well sarah why don't you explain it was mostly your teaching so yeah, so the idea of mobile sanctuaries is just the idea that we embody um, um, the ideas of Torah everywhere we go so that as we walk around and encounter our day-to-day -day life that we approach everything with love and care and compassion and mercy and we bring that into spaces or we carry it when people come into our spaces. Oh, that's perfect. Um, <laughs> and I, I just this is something that I've been turning over in my head for weeks now. And, uh, I really think that is the purpose. Uh, we're supposed to be, um, helping others, loving others. We're supposed to be like a, uh, shining light for others. And, um, to me that doesn't play out like the kind of evangelical thing of like, well, I'm going to tell you what the truth is and you need to believe this truth or you're going to hell. Like that to me does not feel like being a, a mobile vessel of salvation and safety. Um, and I think, uh, unfortunately, a lot of Christianity is based on doing whatever we need to do here so that we can have a good afterlife um, instead of saying, well, how can I, how can I bring heaven to earth now? How can I be that kingdom of heaven for others now? Yeah. Yeah. I think the idea of spurring one another on towards good deeds is like what the church should be. Absolutely. And, and this is where, I think, again, we tend to have these mindsets that the church has to be a space that makes us feel better or feel worse right. about ourselves. Yeah. And, and really, the church should be a time when people are gathering together to discuss ways in which and dream about the ways in which the world 
could be better. And then uh, going out and doing that during the week and coming back and reporting on what did that look like this week? Yeah. And reporting on how, how did we see faithfulness enacted around us? And even identifying where God was moving, right? Like I think about the the sailors with Jonah all the time. Oh, yeah. Right? So Jonah's told to go and uh, ask Nineveh to repent. And instead, Jonah jumps on a boat and tries to go the opposite direction. And a storm arises and the sailors immediately think it's a God that's angry about something. There's already all this mythos around, uh, you know, the abyss and all that with water. And so here they are out to sea and this storm arises. They wake up Jonah. All the crew are on the deck. They cast lots to see who the gods are angry at or mm-hmm. a god is angry at. Mm-hmm. And the lots point to Jonah. Mm-hmm. One, first of all, either that's incredibly lucky or the fact that God... Or w- unlucky if you're doing it. <laughs> um, that God honored their process right, right, of right. determining something, yeah. which I think we overlook. It points to Jonah. Their first reaction is not to sacrifice Jonah, right. throw Jonah overboard. Yeah. And instead, their very first response is they take all of their livelihood, the stuff that they're, they're delivering... They're UPS, right? (laughs) And they throw it overboard in order to um, either appease the God by making offerings. You could look at it that way. Or by lightening the ship and hoping that it can survive uh, the trip. But either way, their first moment was to preserve life. They were being faithful. Yeah. Yeah. And how many of us would do the same, you know? I, I mean, I don't know that any of us would even cast lots to see what God well, was true. angry at who. But and I would hope most people also wouldn't just toss a person overboard. But like the, the analogy, you know, of how many of us do the, do the thing of, you know, arguing to save the people in Sodom and Gomorrah or, or uh, you know, wrestle with God. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Um or Moses saying, if you're going to wipe them out, wipe me out. Also. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just, that's just not the spirit I see most of the time in church. And when you were talking about like the, the, um, like what's taught every Sunday, um, I, you said feel better or worse. And it made me, I was, I've been trying to nail this down. I've been trying to figure this out. And you saying that made me, I think I've figured it out. My memory of, like the mega church that we went to and most other churches that I've been to um, is that the sermons were always either about feeling better about what you believe or feeling worse about how you behave. Oof. I've been puzzling over this for weeks and I'm like, I feel like there was a lot of messages about, you know, just you need to do better and like things were stepping on your toes and everything. But I also, I was, but I was like, but I also feel like there are a lot of inspirational messages. So I was trying to figure that out. And I think that's what it is. Yeah. Anyway, (laughs) my revelation. Nice. (laughs) (laughs) So, um, I've loved this conversation. Is there, are there any, um, is there more that you want to say? Are there any like final thoughts you want to share to wrap up? How do, yeah. I'd want to hear first from the two of you, if this has helped shift anything or if, uh, or what this might look like for you now, if you're thinking about how do I think about faith versus faithfulness? I think it's definitely going to shift how I use the word faith and it'll take some work to like, I feel like it's probably going to be like a, red flag whenever anybody I hear anybody use it. So Mm -hmm. it'll be working on like hearing it and then auto correcting in my brain. (laughs) So I'm excited to, to think about it differently yeah, and look at all the way it's, it's used and apply these ideas to that. 
Yeah. Um, and could lead to some interesting conversations if you want to even ask them, like, yeah. do you mean faith or faithfulness? <laughs> and like, what? Um, but yeah, I think, um, it's, I don't think I ever really parsed it out that way before. And, and even just the definition of what faith is has always been a little, um, cumbersome for me. Uh, so I love this way of looking at it and it's given me a lot to think about. Uh, so. Yeah. It also reminds me, it's like, I've always hoped that my life would be what we've talked about on this podcast and maybe I didn't have the words for it, but that would be faithful. Yeah. But faithful in like, not that like people would just like, like not in an outwardly way, like not like oh, she goes to church or, oh, she mm. wears a cross around her neck or, or oh, she wears Jesus shirts. And a bumper you know? sticker. Yeah. But that like in plain clothes with nothing indicating my faith right. that yeah. people would be able to recognize that I'm, I live faithfully. Yes. Yeah. And that, that is so much what I am, am striving to do and I'm striving to figure out how to do, I guess, um, uh, is I want that faithfulness. Uh, and I, by that, I mean everything we've been talking about and not like label as Christian kind of thing. I want that to be evident. Like if I can, I, <laughs> this might sound silly, but I was like, like, uh, when people, some people came over to play games last night and I was just like, okay, I just want to be this presence that comforts people. <laughs> I'm comforting. I'm comforting. Like, that's like, how it starts, though, I feel. Like, for me, yeah. Like, I feel like that's how it starts. And I'm just like, I because I think there are, I think sometimes you do feel that with people. Like, Don always has strangers coming up to him, telling him their life stories. And, like, just, it, and I think there's something about Don that people know, like, oh, he'd be willing to listen and it's might the beard. have some good advice. <laughs> Um, so do I need to grow one out too? <laughs> that's, that's my next step. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, I just thought like, I have, uh, I feel like my resting face <laughs> <laughs> is not Bleep. always <laughs> the kindest looking. Like, I think I just kind of look like, you know, either met or, or sad or upset, just like, Cause my, my like corners of my mouth, like turned down and stuff like that. And so I'm like, okay, I'm probably putting people, some people off, you know, like, how do I become that? I don't know. I just want to like walk into a room and, and heal everyone. <laughs> it's a little much, but yeah. you know, keep an eye out for Tana's uh, televangelist podcast <laughs> coming out soon. <laughs> yeah. I think the thing I want people to take away is regardless of where you are uh, in either the process of deconstruction, the process of learning about God and godliness, that that place, that, that where you are in the process does not predetermine whether or not God would say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. Mm, yeah. Uh, that there are people that leave the church for faithful reasons. Yeah. And, or maybe leave the church and find faithfulness. Yeah. And that's not only okay, it's the right thing. Yeah. So. Wayne, that's a great place to end. Good job, Don. Thanks. <laughs> well done, you meant. <laughs> well done, faithful servant. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so thank you all for uh, joining us. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. See ya. Hey, thanks for listening. If you'd like to learn more about AJFF, you can go to AJFFpodcast.com. And from there, you can find more episodes, links to our socials, and more. You can also look us up on YouTube with the handle at AJFF. Also, if you really liked what you heard today, we invite you to subscribe, rate, and review as that will help us get in front of more people. And finally, if you'd like to support the work we do, please go to buymeacoffee.com slash AJFF and you can become a regular supporter or just leave us a tip.
Thanks.